Jesus is crazy. Now, that's blasphemy, but it is the one thing that everyone is in agreement in our gospel text today. The one thing they all agree about Jesus, even his own family, is that Jesus is out of his mind. Now, before you scoff at their unbelief or think to yourself, how could they think such a crazy thing? Let's take a closer look at the passages, and maybe we can come to empathize with this assessment of Jesus. Now, as we do this, I want you to forget all the things you know about Jesus through the eyes of faith. I want you to put yourself in the place of one of His earthly siblings. Jesus is your brother, someone you grew up with. And since Jesus' baptism in Mark 1, your sibling, your little or older brother, however you choose to portray Him, since His baptism in Mark 1, He has been going around and doing the sort of things that nobody really does. He has already, by chapter 3 in Mark, and Mark goes pretty quick, but already by chapter 3, He's called His disciples, and He tells them that they're going to become fishers of men, whatever that means. And He's healing people, and He's casting out demons. He's touching and associating with unclean people while doing His miracles. In Mark chapter 2, He even touches someone with leprosy. Nobody does that. He's broken many of the traditions of the culture, such as fasting and the Sabbath, and He's butt heads with the religious leaders over these things. He's even called Himself the Lord of the Sabbath. And by the end of today's text, He's going to redefine even what family means. So it is into this environment we get to our text for today. And everyone agrees on one thing. Jesus is out of His mind. But what do you think? If we put it that way, would you reach the same conclusion that they do? Try to imagine Jesus doing the equivalence of what would be sort of transgressions and violations of our culture, breaking traditions that we hold so close and so central, associating with people that we think we should never associate with. My guess is we would come to the exact same conclusion that His family does something's wrong with Jesus. He's behaving like nobody else is behaving. He's out of his mind. Now, from a spiritual perspective, we can put our eyes of faith back on. This makes sense to us because what happens in Jesus' baptism? The Spirit of God descends upon Him, which is at odds with the Spirit of this world. In fact, the very first thing that happens when the Spirit of God descends on Jesus is He drives Him into the wilderness to face off against Satan. Satan is the ruler of this world for now. And that spirit of this world has been around ever since the events of our Old Testament reading today took place, the fall into sin. But now one has come who is going to oppose those things who has been given a new spirit, a spirit not of this world. Now, the scribes in the text take things a bit further. They may agree with Jesus' family that He's out of His mind, but they give a more nefarious explanation as to why that is. They say that the reason that Jesus is able to heal people and cast out demons is because He Himself is possessed by the devil the prince of demons. Now, this is an even more serious blasphemy against God than saying that Jesus is out of His mind. Now, we're, fully, we're going to fully flesh out the consequences of that blasphemy in a moment, because there's a lot of misunderstandings about what Jesus is about to say. But it does begin an explanation from Jesus that leads to a crucial teaching and perhaps a revelation of the most insane thing that Jesus does of all a thing that really does make him seem crazy or out of his mind. So after they say this about Jesus, here's what he says to them in response. And he called them to him and said to them in parables, how can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, 
He cannot stand, but is coming to an end. So just on that level, what they're saying of Jesus doesn't make sense. So he's trying to teach them that it doesn't make sense that the devil would cast out his own unclean spirits because then he is defeating himself. And then he describes what's really going on when we get to verse 27. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man. Then indeed he may plunder his house. Now the language here is a bit confusing, so we need to identify who's who. The one entering the house is Jesus, and the strong man is the devil. And what he's explaining to them is unless someone comes who's capable of defeating the strong man, no one will be able to plunder the goods from his house. And you and I are the goods. We are the ones that have been ensnared just like our parents long ago, Adam and Eve, by the devil. He has captured the world and the spirits of its inhabitants, and someone needs to set them free. Jesus is saying, that's me. No one's going to be able to do it unless they can first bind the strong man. So go ahead and add this to the list of the crazy things that your brother Jesus is doing that doesn't make any sense to you, that makes you, in fact, embarrassed, and you want to grab him and put him somewhere where he's not going to bother so many people, because he's causing quite a ruckus. One of the continual themes in the book of Mark is there's a massive crowd following Jesus wherever he goes. The text even starts with that, that he went home and the crowd gathered again so that they could not even eat. There were so many people squeezed together because they all wanted to see this crazy man, Jesus. Now, can you imagine being one of his family members? It makes some sense that they're starting to say, somebody grab this guy and let's hide till all this blows over. But the craziest thing that Jesus is going to do, he outlines in verse 27, is he is going to take on the biggest, baddest force in this world, head on. That's what he's come to do. That's what the Spirit of God, which inhabited him through his baptism, has given him in the mission of God, the salvation of creation, his opposition to the spirit of this world. I must confess, as I was thinking about the image of what that would look like, I imagine some scenarios where we have a similar reaction to bold acts of courage. When someone finally decides to stand up to the big bad bully at school, one of the thoughts we often have is, oh, he's really going to do that? He's crazy. And it certainly looks like Jesus is the small one in this picture against an arrayed host of authority and power he has no hope of triumphing over. But to answer your incredulous question, is he really going to do it? Is he really going to stand up to that guy? Jesus' answer is yes. This is the path that Jesus has been walking in earnest since his baptism. Why he's preaching, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Because the ruler of this world is going to lose. This path leads to direct confrontation with Satan himself. In order to free us from his grip, someone must come and bind him. Jesus is here to do exactly that. Now, getting back to the serious blasphemy against the Holy Spirit... The people accusing Jesus of being possessed by Satan are in fact accusing that the very work of the Holy Spirit of God is the work of the devil. Here's what Jesus has to say in response to their statements. Truly I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the children of man and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness but is guilty of an eternal sin. Now, I can't tell you the number of times that I've had questions brought to me as a pastor about this passage, often from people who are afraid that they may have committed this sin, 
and are wondering if they can be forgiven. Why is this blasphemy unforgivable as Jesus describes it? Well, it isn't sort of what many people think, which is that somebody said a sentence and even later they come to regret saying it, but it doesn't matter anymore because that can't be forgiven. That isn't what Jesus is describing here. What Jesus is describing is the stance or the alignment that you take when you blaspheme the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the person of the Trinity who brings all the means of grace from Jesus to you. If you take confirmation class here, you'll learn that the Holy Spirit's job is to give us the Jesus stuff, the Word of the Gospel, the sacraments of His body and blood, and the water and Word in baptism. And if you have decided and aligned yourself against those works, as if they are the work of the devil himself, we can track what happens to those who do that. The scribes and the Pharisees, what do they end up doing when it comes to Jesus? They line up against Him. They oppose God's plan of salvation that is being worked out through Him as if it is a threat to their very lives. That's why Jesus speaks so seriously to this because He doesn't want us to line up against Him or against the work of God, but with Him, believing in the work, not that it is the work of the devil that threatens you, but it is the work of God that frees you. See, what Jesus is doing when He heals and when He casts out demons is setting creation in small ways free from sin and the devil all things pointing forward to His great act of deliverance, His great healing of all creation through the death on the cross and resurrection on Easter morning. But all the while, those who blaspheme the Holy Spirit, who think that Jesus' work is not God's work, but in fact the work of the devil, they reject and oppose it and Him. They align themselves against Him and they kill Him. Now, we know that they're unwittingly participating in the plan that God has set forth for even their salvation, such is the depth of the grace and mercy of God, that even those who oppose Him, who have lined themselves up against Him, He still reaches out in mercy so that they may come to faith and align with Him rather than against Him. And this brings us to the last part of our text, where Jesus does one more thing that sounds like somebody who's out of their mind would do, as He redefines who the family is. His family members who are desperately trying to get to Him, and you have this curious image that Jesus will then invert of Jesus in the middle, a big crowd of people around Him that His family think are just strangers, and then His family on the outside trying to get in. And even somebody from the crowd has to tell Jesus, hey, Jesus, your family's outside. They want to speak with you. And he answers them, who are my mother and my brothers? And looking out at that crowd of people around him, he says, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. I imagine that probably put his earthly family over the edge a bit, because family was a quite serious thing, probably even more serious than it is to us, despite the fact that we also take family very seriously. It is the basic building block of human social culture anywhere and at all times. And yet, Jesus is redefining what that is, that family isn't those who share blood and DNA with you, but it is those who are joined with you in doing the will of God. I very intentionally described all of us together here to the kids in the children's message as brothers and sisters in Christ. This is where this phrase comes from. This is why we refer to each other with familial terms, because Jesus describes us in those terms Himself. That our relationship is such, of of such intimacy and importance. 
And he even goes further in other places where Paul describes us as one body made of many members. So much connected and brought together by Jesus that if one thing affects one of us, it affects all of us. And that begins in the same place it began for Jesus, at the baptismal font, where water was poured on your head and the words of God were spoken, and the Holy Spirit of God was given to you, the very same Spirit given to Jesus, this Spirit of God that isn't of this world. And therein begins our downfall we become crazy like Jesus. We begin to live our lives in ways that those who knew us before or simply don't know Jesus can't understand or think we're foolish. We're called to love those whom the world expects us to hate. We don't just love the people who do good things to us. We love and bless even those who oppose us. We're called to lift up and value those who can't do anything for us in return. That's not the way of the world. The way of the world says, you scratch, my, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. Jesus doesn't say those things. We're called to stand defiantly opposed to the big bad force in the world. Now, just in case you can't remember, especially if you were baptized as a baby or your parents or your sponsors answered this question on your behalf, but one of the questions you're asked when you're baptized is this, do you renounce the devil and all his works and all his ways? When you receive the Spirit of God, the answer to that question is yes, just like Jesus opposed him on our behalf. And so, baptized into the Spirit of God, we share in the death of Jesus to sin and his victory over the strong man, the strong man of this world. So just like Jesus, we now walk a path that puts us on a collision course with the spirit of this world. You've probably experienced this in many ways yourselves, times where you're tempted to hide your faith, to hide from God because you're afraid of what might happen in the world that opposes Him, times where You've confessed your faith in Jesus or lived as He's asked you to live, and it has cost you. Maybe it's cost you relationships between family or friends, maybe a job even, maybe your reputation, because people don't always recognize or understand what it is that we're doing. They may think we're out of our minds, but they didn't understand Jesus either. Paul speaks about our new reality beautifully in an, in an encouraging fashion in our epistle reading, 2 Corinthians 4, starting at verse 16. So we do not lose heart, though our outer nature, the old spirit of this world, is wasting away. Our inner nature is being renewed day by day. For this slight momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. God has called you in Jesus through the waters of baptism. He's given you the Spirit of God. And in this new spirit, you now can live as human beings were always meant to live. Crazy, like Jesus. In the name of Jesus, amen.